Good morning. Uh, we've got two topics today. We've got Manifest Destiny and we've got Texas. So that's what this lecture is going to be about here. First of all, Manifest Destiny. And here are two very famous pictures that are supposed to depict Manifest Destiny. At the top, you got pioneers moving west and everything that they're supposed to see. And then at the bottom, you've got uh, Lady Manifest or Lady Liberty going from east to west and moving American ideals with it. Now, what is Manifest Destiny? Well, it's a term that was used throughout the 1840s by American citizens. And it was this idea that Americans were destined by God to spread their beliefs across the continent. I usually like to say, God said, go west. And with the Americans, they're supposed to spread civilization, spread democracy, tame the Native Americans, if you will. And this became the main way or the main thing that people were thinking about in the 1840s. And in a lot of ways, it starts with the Indian removal of Andrew Jackson and Martin Van Buren. Now, these ideas of civilization, democracy, they're going to be spread to Native Americans or other groups, whether they want it or not. It's going to be a forced civilization. It's going to be a forced democratization. And Manifest Destiny is going to be used to justify war with Mexico, prosecution of Native Americans, persecution of Native Americans, and a bunch of different atrocities that are going to be committed. Uh, presidential candidates are all about this. Uh, William Henry Harrison, when he runs for president, manifest destiny. John Tyler, when he's president, he tries to do manifest destiny. James K. Polk, he's about manifest destiny. You get the idea. And added to this manifest destiny, you're going to have gold being discovered in California in 1848, which leads to the very famous 1849 gold rush. So there's a lot of movement west during this time. A big question is where are they going? Most pioneers, most settlers are moving all the way to the west coast. And there are three very important trails that are going to be used during this manifest destiny westward expansion. The most famous of the three is the Oregon Trail. Uh, there's a very famous game out there called Oregon Trail. If you've never played it before, try it once. Let me know what you think. And when I was growing up, it was a great game to play. Now, Oregon was originally British. It was originally part of Canada. Then there was the dispute between Britain and the United States. And eventually a series of negotiations result in the border that we have today. So the Oregon Territory is going to be given to the United States and British Columbia is going to stay British. And a trail is going to begin that stretches all the way from Independence, Missouri, which is near Kansas City, all the way to the Willamette Valley of Oregon, which is just south of where Portland is today. Uh, there's going to be thousands of people. In 1843 alone, there's over a thousand pioneers, 125 wagons, and 5,000 cattle that go for the Pacific Coast. And by the time the Oregon Trail uh, meets its usefulness, uh, there's going to be like 80,000 people that travel from Missouri to Oregon. What's really cool about the Oregon Trail is there were so many people that went and they all took the same path. There are places today in 2020 where the wagon wheel uh, ruts, the, the um, path of the Oregon Trail can still be seen over 100 years later. Another important trail is the California Trail. It's going to start also near Independence, Missouri, and it's going to go all the way to California where the gold was discovered. Now, the California Trail unofficially had existed since the early 1800s, but a man named John C. Fremont, he worked for the U.S. Army. He's going to map out the California Trail in 1843 and 1844, and by the time the gold rush is over, 250,000 people are going to have moved to California, especially in 1848, 1849, 1850. Uh, to give you an idea of how many people traveled on the, the uh, California Trail, in 1847, there were 5,000 people per year going to 
California, 1848, that numbers up to 30,000, 1850, that numbers up to 55,000. So once gold is discovered, once word gets out, people start going to California very quickly. Now, a lesser known trail, but it's also important, is the Santa Fe Trail. That went from St. Louis to Santa Fe, which today is New Mexico, but at the time it was just regular Mexico. And the Santa Fe Trail is going to become the primary trade route between Mexico and the United States. It's also going to be a settlement route, and it's going to be a route that cows and cattle are going to take to get to market as well. So it's going to become pretty important too. Now, where are they not going? They're not going to the Great Plains. The Great Plains was nicknamed the Great American Desert. Uh, I don't know how many of you have ever been to Nebraska or North Dakota, South Dakota, Kansas, Oklahoma, the middle of the country. There's not much there. It's flat. It doesn't rain very much. When they have storms, there are big storms. Um, there's no trees. And it was originally seen as inhospitable. Uh, it was seen as not fit for residents and the Great Plains were originally overlooked by settlers and because it was thought that people couldn't live in the Great Plains that the Native Americans were actually moved there. Now the conditions in the Old West, I hope you've at least seen one Western in your life. It could be a John Wayne Western, it could be a Clint Eastwood Western, it could even be a Will Smith Western, whatever it might be. Uh, you often see tumbleweeds, cowboys and Indians, shootouts, saloons, uh, ladies of the evening, if you know what I mean. Uh, Western style movies, that's just not true. That's not what it was like. Uh, on average, less than 5% of the deaths on, in the West were caused by Native Americans. Most wagon trains never see a Native American, even though Western movies say that they are all attacked by Native Americans. Very rarely did that happen. And more often than not, if a wagon train did meet a Native American group, they'd be given food, water, shelter, and help. So what caused most of the deaths? It was disease or it was accidents. Cholera, where um, cholera is very, very popular, or not popular, but it happens a lot. Scarlet fever happened a lot. Starvation, just because of lack of food. Accidents, because something happens and there's no medical help. And all total, it's like 20,000 deaths that happen while people are moving out west. So it's risky. The most famous example of moving west and having bad things happen is the Donner Party. And the Donner Party is going to be featured as your word of the day. Today's secret word is chocolate. Chocolate, because it's almost Easter time and most people like chocolate. So word of the day is chocolate. Now you might be asking, what does chocolate have to do with the dinner party? Well, that's kind of twisted, but you'll see. All right, the Donner Party. George Donner is going to be this fairly well-off, prominent Illinois farmer. He decides he's going to move his family out west. And this trip is almost, it's doomed from the beginning. He leaves way too late. Uh, instead of leaving in early spring, he leaves in late spring. Uh, he's going to take more stuff than he does supplies. He's going to load up his car with as much stuff as he can, and he's going to leave out food and things like that. And he's traveling out west. He's trying to get to Oregon, and he decides to take a shortcut across the Utah Mountains. Uh, it's a place he's never been, there aren't any maps, and George Donner says, you know what, I'm a farmer from Illinois, I know how to make a map better than anybody else. So, uh, the group gets lost right outside what would be today the Great Salt Lake, and Salt Lake City. Uh, they start to lose wagons, they lose their livestock, uh, they keep traveling, they meet another group of people who say, you know what, we're going to California, you don't need to go to Oregon. So in this middle of this trip where they're already not prepared, they change direction and they head into the Sierra Nevada mountains. The Sierra Nevada mountains, those are the mountains that are right next to Nevada and California. Well, while they're in the mountains, almost to their destination, 
in California, they get caught in this two week long snowstorm that they're not prepared for. And in order to survive, they resort to cannibalism. Um, they start to eat each other. It's pretty gross. They, they start eating dead people, then they start eating alive people. And by the time a search party finds them, there are only half the people alive. There were about 80 people in their group and about 40 are going to be rescued. The rest of them were eaten. Pretty gross. But now you see the connection with today's secret word. All right, the other one is Texas. Uh, American settlers start moving to Texas as early as the 1820s. And Texas was originally part of Mexico. Uh, Mexico won its independence from Spain in the late 18-teens, early 1820s. And the new Mexican government is going to invite people to move in. But there are certain things that these people of Mexico have to agree to. Uh, one of the things that the people of, of um, Texas have to agree to, no slavery. A lot of the settlers who are going to come into Texas are from the south. They want to bring their slaves. Mexico says, uh-uh, no slavery. So the Americans say, okay, they're not slaves. They are lifelong indentured servants. Aha, we'll use a loophole. The other thing, Mexico is a Catholic country and the settlers were required to convert to Catholicism. So these American settlers say, sure, with their fingers crossed, we'll become Catholic. In reality, they didn't. They stayed Protestant, they stayed Methodist, they stayed Baptist, whatever it was, but they did not become Catholic. They just pretended. And the last thing, the Mexican government says, okay, you're gonna become Mexican citizens, you can still get stuff from the United States if you want, but you have to pay an import tax because this is Mexico. And most settlers refused to pay that tax and they would smuggle in American made goods in a black market. So Mexico just had three simple rules and these American settlers, they broke all three. By 1835, the tensions between the American settlers and the Mexican government, they reach this boiling point and a fight breaks out. And the Alamo, which I have a picture of here, is the most famous example of this. The American settlers in Mexico, they're now called Texicans. These Texicans are going to take over the Alamo. Now, what was the Alamo? It was actually an old Spanish church or a Spanish mission that the Mexican government had repurposed into a government building. And the Texicans take it over. The Mexican government wants to take back their government building. And so they attack the Alamo and they try to take back the building that the Texicans had stolen. A fight breaks out and of the 250 or so Texicans who had taken over the Alamo, a little over 200 of them die, including some very famous people like Davy Crockett, Daniel Boone, and David Bowie, B-O-W-I-E, of the Bowie knife. Because of the Alamo, Texas is going to declare its independence. The leader is going to be Sam Houston, who the city of Houston is named after. Uh, independence is declared from Mexico. A fight breaks out, and this fight lasts about two months. The dictator of Mexico, a guy named Santa Ana, is forced to sign a treaty. Now, Texas, they never wanted to become an independent country. They hoped that as soon as they declared independence, that the United States would swoop them up and make the Texas part of the U.S. And some representatives from the Texas government meet Andrew Jackson, but Andrew Jackson is, he's kind of busy with that whole removing Indians thing, so he, he doesn't act on it. Also, the United States, they don't really want to go to war with Mexico. They want to keep the peace on the southern border, but, um, you know, there's also this anti-slavery faction. They know that if Texas is brought into the United States, that it's going to be a slave state. And they kind of want to keep the 
balance between free state and slave state for as long as they can. And Texas is going to be, it's going to be an independent country from 1835 to 1846. In fact, Texas, this is a unique fact. Texas is the only state in the country that can fly their flag level with the United States flag. And if you go to Texas, you'll see there are two flagpoles, one with the Texas state flag, one with the U.S. flag, and they are flown equal with each other. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, the annexation of Texas. Finally, in 1845, Congress is going to vote to bring Texas into the United States. And there is a war that's caused with Mexico. This becomes the Mexican-American War. The president at the time, James K. Polk, he sends a negotiator to Mexico to try and work it out peacefully. Uh, he is going to offer to buy California, Arizona, and New Mexico for a fee and going to ask, can we please have Texas since it's already an independent country? And the negotiator's not welcome. He's kicked out of Mexico City and sent home. Uh, eventually, negotiations do happen. There's a dispute over what the boundary of Texas is going to be. And eventually, the United States says, you know what? We're going to take the bigger part of Texas, the one that we think is ours. And the U.S. Army is going to move into the territory just north of the Rio Grande. And that sets off the Mexican-American War. The war begins on April 25th, 1846. It lasts just about two years. It does not go very well for Mexico, and Mexico is forced to surrender when Mexico City is invaded. The U.S. Marines knock on the door of the Mexican government and say, Hi guys, we're here. Are you ready to surrender now? The result of this is the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, the United States gets most of the Southwest. They get access to California, Nevada, Utah, most of New Mexico, most of Arizona, the only parts of New Mexico and Arizona that they don't get in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo is the very, very southern tip. The very southern tip of New Mexico and Arizona, they're bought in 1859 through the Gadsden Purchase. And if you're curious why we bought that, I mean, there's really not anything there except for desert. It was so that a railroad could be built there. And I don't know if that railroad was ever actually built. So... Just uh, some interesting information. Now, one last thing for you today, and I hope you listen to this because this is important. Registration for summer is going to open on Monday, and it's only going to be summer registration. Fall registration is going to be put off to a later time. The other important thing you have to know about summer is at, all the summer classes are going to be online only. No face-to-face -face classes for summer, only online classes um, so I do hope that you still sign up for some classes over the summer we'll do the best we can as teachers instructors and professors for you to make those summer classes a success but no face-to-face -face classes will be offered during the summer we just found that out this morning all right that's it for now uh, make sure that you do your quizzes Make sure you check the course calendar for any work that you may have due this week. And we'll see you on Thursday with another video.